Thanks, Cynthia, for the nice introduction. And thank you to Kinsaw for having me here. Um, so I'm just going to sort of speak uh, briefly about my work and the trajectory. As Cynthia mentioned, I work in a variety of different mediums. Um, so this is sort of, I guess, uh, indicative of some early work um, that I was doing. Uh, this is where I first started exhibiting a series of self-portraits in which I composited um, multiple images of myself on location um, in different sets to create sort of loose-knit narrative situations. Um, this was in the late 90s during Photoshop's nascency, and so I was using like that early technology to create these scenarios in, in which there's a level of ambiguity and where you're coming into the narrative midway and um, there's not necessarily a clear-cut um, delineation of, of what's going on. So, for example, in this image, it's not clear if, if the figure is being held in a protective embrace or has been caught um, or if the figures climbing over the fence are breaking into a space or escaping from something. And it's that level of ambiguity in these kind of transitional in-between states that I strive for in my work, whether it's photography, drawing, painting, video. Um, within this work, I was kind of interested in exploring the idea of how there's this almost archetypal figure that I've created and that there's not necessarily any uh, differentiation between victim and victimizer. Um, a lot of the early work uh, dealt with coming of age issues in adolescence and using the idea of adolescence as almost a transitional stage in and of itself. And um, then that progressed to uh, larger, kind of more historical themes. I was dealing a lot uh, with issues of labor and work and detention. Um, this image in particular is called window washers, and so it's this notion that they're enacting this never-ending task of cleaning the windows with their tongues. Um, here, this almost Sisyphean task of uh, snow removal or bringing snow to this location. Um, and so it's sort of, these images depict this group work in which the figures work uh, simultaneously, uh, almost like worker bees or drones. Uh, this is one of the last images uh, in which I included myself in that sort of self-portrait self mode. Uh, this is called Grave Diggers. And I began to realize that while working in this vein, that once I had completed a shoot uh, in location, I was really interested in how the location looked afterwards. Um, there, was, there were so many props and, and the things that I was doing in the environments to alter the space. That caught my interest, and I was more interested in that than the performative aspects of the earlier work. And so I began trying to create narratives in which the viewer is coming in almost in the past tense. So you're seeing this leftover evidence of human interaction. Um, I also began uh, including animals into the photographs. They almost were taking the place of the characters and the figures that were in the earlier work. So for instance, in this image, all the way, uh, I guess if you're looking on the right-hand side, um, there's a couple of deer, and one of them is shedding felt off of its antlers, and it's hanging and mimicking in the same way that the toilet paper is, is hanging off of the trees. Um, so, and also in this body of work, uh, I was able to kind of go into these environments and move the camera around and photograph different elements that I liked within a single environment and then composite it into one cohesive environment. And prior to that, um, I was setting up the camera on a tripod and like my cardinal rule was not to move that tripod because then in post-production it was very difficult for me to put things back together. Um, but because I was dealing with these environments, uh, I started moving the camera around um, to try to capture everything that would be in the periphery and, and create like this ultimate mood or atmosphere of this space. And in doing so, you're, you're moving the camera and you're getting this two-point perspective that keeps shifting. And so when you see these images, which are, are actually much larger than this, um, like this image, 
I think is about 55 inches by 75 inches. Um, you, as a viewer, are kind of absorbed in it, and that two-point perspective guides your eye around it, and you sort of float through the image in a way that, um, I guess it, it sort of helps me as an artist manipulate the viewer into seeing certain key aspects of the work. Um, so this body of work, I began working with other people and including the figure back into the landscape, but kind of in a almost secondary uh, or a, a supporting cast member role to this environment. Um, this image is from a short film that I did called Kidnap. Uh, in which there's this ritual that's enacted. They, they build this big bonfire, uh, set it alight at dawn, and it burns all the way through dusk, or dusk, dawn. I always mix those up. But uh, I'm interested in including um, other figures into the work, but not particularly interested in depicting their likeness. So many of them are wearing masks, or they're hooded, or their faces are painted, or they're obscured in these environments. And within all of these landscapes, I was also interested in kind of creating almost an outsider community in which there's always some sort of uh, inhabitation, or that, like here there's a lean-to, uh, you know, prior to that there were these makeshift forts, um, and then here there's a tent in which you can see a silhouette of figures, it's not clear in my mind whether they're you know, fighting or making out, and it's that ambiguity, uh, again, that I'm interested in. Here, uh, several shipwrecks encircle this island, and this is probably a good example of how uh, I was felt a level of freedom in moving the camera around in the sense that the mountains in the background are from New Zealand, and some of the rocky shores and the waters are from Canada, and so, you know, at this point, I'm kind of creating a landscape that doesn't actually exist in real life, and there, it sort of mimics almost the way that I uh, paint and draw. Um, these images are taken simultaneous to a film that I was working on. Uh, it's a 30-minute short film called The Septemberus, and it basically takes uh, the idea of ritual and brings it one step further back. Uh, and so the whole film is about the notion of the ritual in preparing for an actual ritual. So um, these figures work in unison uh, on this kind of commune where they wake at the same time. They go out and they harvest uh, cotton from this steamy greenhouse. Uh, they then shear sheep and they go into the forest in the middle of the night and serenade this pond and harvest octopi to um, dissect them and take out their ink sacs and then spin all of that cotton and wool into fabric and create the clothing for their rituals and then they dye it with that ink from the octopus and uh, enact this kind of hybridized baptism, funeral, wedding situation. Um, it sounds a little odd, but it makes sense when you watch it. <laughs> so, and the whole film is, is wordless. They all work in unison, almost as if they are worker bees or drones. Uh, it has musical ac accompaniment, so each group, as they split off, have almost like a Peter and the Wolf, uh, Prokiev nod, where you know, they're accompanied by a particular musical instrument. Um, and so, at this point, you know, I often work in this way that I have these reactions not only to what's going on around me and my own personal circumstances, but I have these reactions to and against my own work. And I feel like this film and this body of photographs um, sort of encapsulated everything that I was interested in working in uh, for so long. The idea of adolescence, ritual, transition, these kind of lush, verdant landscapes, uh, this idea of narrative, uh, an almost fairy tale like setting. And I kind of felt at that point that I'd had almost enough of that and, and wanted to embark on something completely different, or at least in my mind, something that felt different. Uh, so I began shooting in black and white and photographing these more urban environments and paying more attention 
um, to like the skies and, and what was happening above the horizon line. It was very much influenced by Flemish paintings and how these Dutch masters in their landscapes kind of incorporated that uh, element into their work. Um, so these works do take on, again, that kind of more urban, concrete environment. They also have a stronger environmental slant to them. Um, the idea of, of climate change and desolation. Um, I also began working uh, with older people in the work. Um, so although they're sort of minuscule within the composition, the figure sitting on the stone wall here is a friend of mine. She's older and agreed to pose within the work. Um, and then again, the actual environments don't exist as you're seeing them. So these cliff sides are from New Zealand, the water towers are from New York, uh, the tram lines are from Berlin, and the koi pond uh, is uh, from Vancouver. So I'm really like taking elements that as I travel, I sort of photograph them, add them to my own uh, personal digital library, and then use those uh, later to composite these images. Um, here you can see in this burnt out, like desolate building, um, there are a series of hammocks with people laying within the hammocks. Um, and I was just very interested as well, like trying to create these compositions that felt uh, very decimated, but also chaotic. Um, and because they are all staged and constructed, I mean, that's, it's something that um, I found was very difficult to um, craft chaos um, because, you know, the mere act of planning to go out and photograph something involves that, you know, something that's contradictory to chaos, which is planning. So um, it's kind of like working against myself there. Um, and then that sort of led into uh, a series of photographs where I wanted to actually construct elements within the landscape almost as these makeshift temporary monuments or sculptures. Um, and so I began uh, embarking on this body of, of landscape photographs. This is called Stained Glass Forest, a little bit of an homage to um, Marcel Duchamp in the bottle uh, drying rack that he has his ready-made. Um, and so this is sort of an example of, you know, it's something that I could have staged within the environment, but I only had one bottle drying rack and so kind of moved it around and reconfigured things um, and then set off like these little smoke bombs and moved that around and then in post-production was able to create a holistic image in which I was, you know, crafting together parts of the forest and all of these different elements um, much the way that I would uh, in painting. So these are just a few more of those images. And um, as Cynthia mentioned in the introduction, my whole family is, is Cuban and immigrated to the United States uh, in the early 60s. And that's something that underpins a lot of my work, that notion of transition and migration um, and also impermanence. Um, and so it comes out more strongly in some works than, the, than in others. This is an image called Spanish Moss, uh, and so I feel like this is a good example of how it, it sort of you know, creeps into my work more strongly uh, in certain pieces. Um, this is one of the last photos that I finished uh, and it just sort of strangely, this is an image that I did right before uh, the pandemic. And so it was strange to have been working on this image in New York. And then shortly after, there were like so many tents erected. Um, I was thinking more of like refugee camps and I was uh, referencing Bruegel and that kind of thing. But as is the case with so many of the images, like down the road, they end up changing due to circumstance and their interpretation can change and I really enjoy that that can happen and so that might not have been my initial goal or intent but I'm happy to have those kind of readings uh, put on it you know from the viewer. So I mentioned uh, some of the drawings and paintings that I had been working on simultaneously and so these are examples of that they're really large-scale uh, pieces this one I think is about eight feet by 10 feet, and they're done on uh, sheets of, of mylar. And mylar uh, is a material that 
architects or graphic artists use. It's semi-translucent, and I use it uh, so that I can work on both the front and the back. Uh, when you draw or paint on the back side of it, you can flip it over and you can still see that image through it, but it has a sort of foggy, waxy, atmospheric quality to it. And so I use that to affect within the, in the work. Um, so many of the trees in the distance have this foggy uh, look to them, and that's because they're actually done on the rear side of the, the film uh, itself. And the paper comes in these rolls that are about 42 inches high, but they're you know 100 yards long. And so in order to create these larger compositions, I was uh, seaming the paper together along compositional lines. And so it's sort of an interesting element in the sense that the paper gets layered and stitched together in an almost analog process of what I was doing in Photoshop with the photographs. Uh, so they very much reference each other, not just in content, but also in their, the way that they're made. Um, there is this element of cut and paste and layer and collage uh, that gets flattened out. And because they have such a film-like quality, uh, they then get mounted to museum board and cradled. And they end up having this strange uh, hybrid quality where it feels filmic uh, because of the surface, but also painterly. Um, so they sort of exist between those two worlds. And a lot of them kind of play with the dynamic of that intersection between uh, humanity and nature uh, that is depicted in a lot of the photographs as well. I also am really interested in breaking out of conceived notions of how something has to be displayed or demonstrated. So, for instance, with some of the earlier photographs, I have some images that you know are uh, about 12 feet or 24 feet long, and the way that they get hung or positioned, it's not possible to view it all at in one time. You have to like walk along the image to see it. And I always liked the idea of breaking out of the traditional format of like a negative and that sort of 8x10 or 16x20 format. Um, and so I kind of extended that same practice to painting and drawing. Um, so this is a freestanding painting I painted directly on a movie screen. And this is essentially, it's in my mind, a painting of a video still. And the video still is a, almost like a screen grab of a scene where there's a makeshift screen within this environment. So there's this self-referential aspect to it. And then the subtitles are painted directly on top. And it's one of the last lines from a 1961 film, The Misfits, with Clark Gable and Marilyn Monroe. And it was coincidentally both of their last films, because they died shortly after. And it's also the year that my family had uh, immigrated to the States. So there's this whole like subtext to it all, but I chose that film just because the landscape plays such a key element within that film, and so it's a reference to that as well. Um, here I took uh, paintings that I'd done of these trees that are sort of being supported by scaffolding, um, and then mounted them to museum board and inserted them into these large stones to create somewhat of a Japanese rock garden. And if you look at the reverse side, you see this scaffolding structure that's mimicked uh, almost like the back of a stage set. So there's this idea of artifice built in uh, that I'm revealing from the reverse side as well. And that scaffolding is mimicked here again uh, with this photographic seamless that I built. And sitting on top of it, it's a series of 16 portraits um, positioned on music stands, roughly at human height. And it creates a, a chorus of, of mourners. Each portrait, their face is, is covered by a, a sort of drapery cloth. And so it counteracts the notion of, of portraiture, where you're actually trying to depict someone's face. Here, the portrait is being depicted through their gestures and through their, their grief. Um, this also has a sound piece that accompanies it. Uh, it's Mozart's Mass, Requ Mass Requiem, 
and it's a funerary march and I've slowed it down one time for each choral member. So it kind of sounds like this low hum Gregorian chant or like a, a whale's mating call um, and lends this like otherworldly uh, eeriness to the piece. Uh, this is a half glass, half drawing installation. Um, the cinder blocks are cast in crystal leaded glass and then drawings are inserted into these hand-blown glass bottles. And each bottle contains a portrait of a family member from Cuba. Um, the glass bottles are completely one piece and so they're sealed in there permanently, the drawings are. And they're sitting atop this low-lying wall. It references the wall, um, it's called the Malacón in, in Havana, and it's like the sea barrier wall where people gather and, and hang out. And um, so these are images taken from photographs that I grew up uh, uh, with of different members within my family. And as I began, um, working on this series of portraits because I felt like a urge to actually investigate a more traditional means of, you know, photography, or not photography, portraiture. Uh, and so I wanted it to resonate with me personally and I used my heritage as a way to dissect that. Um, and I had traveled to Cuba and was fortunate enough to be able to visit my parents old house and I got the blueprints for it and so I used the blueprints to draw out the schematics on the gallery floor and then created a almost negative version of the same piece. Um, and then those blueprints again I used to reconstruct a scale model of their home and then that housed a projector uh, and it's a video of me in a boat um, filled with cinder blocks and I'm jettisoning them from the boat and the cinder block kind of became a key element in this body of work. You see it in the glass uh, blown cinder blocks in here and in the video. And it's because when I was in Cuba, so many of the buildings are in a deteriorated state from past hurricanes and you can see the foundations. And it sort of struck me that these cinder blocks are these beautiful units of sculpture, but they're also these elements that, you know, when you put together, you can sort of make this pedestal. And so I was using it to literally kind of put my family's past on this pedestal and um, within this body of work. Um, this is a, a drawing diptych. Um, it's this is my maternal grandmother and paternal grandmother. And they're both laid out in these vitrines, almost like uh, specimens in an archeological uh, display case. Um, inside are smaller glass vitrines and their uh, different body parts and limbs are pinned in. And the overall conceit is that it's a little bit like a reliquary. Uh, the drawings are done almost in uh, x-ray form, so it's layers of that mylar again, and you can see through the different layers um, and see through the flesh to the bone. Uh, and then in the pelvic region of each uh, display case, there's a sonogram, and so you can see like, you know, hints at the future generations of, of my family. Um, and that sort of, that format it's something that I was interested in and, and mimicked again here. Um, I was invited to participate in a show in Berlin. Uh, this show, it was called Between the Worlds and it was interested in discussing the idea of um, adolescent immigrants, particularly from Syria. And it resonated with me because of my own family's history. Um, but you know, the conceit of the show was that uh, these are people who are literally between two states. They're, they're not children, they're not adults, they're not in their homeland, they're not in a place where they feel settled. Uh, and so this is the installation that I conceived. Um, it's a series of seven drawings, life-size figures, uh, sleeping, and they're sort of wrapped in this, these quilted fabrics and it's rear mounted on really thick acrylic resin so that it refracts with it inside and you can see almost like a double image depending on where you're standing. Um, they are mounted or, or sort of straddling um, these pillow sandbag structures that I made. They're 
cast in plaster, and so they're actually really hard uh, and sturdy, even though they look soft. Um, and the overall effect is a sort of combination of sleeping bag, body bag. Um, they look a little bit like uh, statuary or sarcophagi. And when you're there visiting the space, you know, as a viewer, you're forced to look down over them. And so it imparts this kind of uh, a strange sense of fragility on the work. And as a viewer, you have this sort of creepy sense of, of voyeurism. Uh, so the way that it fills the room it has this psychological impact. I use those same uh, plaster cast pillows uh, for a couple of other pieces as well. This is a mixture of a drawing photo collage that I then printed onto that same kind of acrylic resin slab. Um, and this is another example of that. And the, the slab is just sort of embedded and cast into that plaster. Um, you can get a better sense here of how the technique of this sort of refraction of the light happens. Um, these are images that I took, I uh, researched and downloaded archival mug shots of people who had been arrested uh, roughly between the late 30s up until 1969, and they were arrested for being deviants or you know, essentially for being gay. And I took their mug shots and made them look more as if they were photographed in a sort of night vision infrared style. Um, blew them up, made them more grainy, and then inserted them into these stone structures. Um, they look almost like granite grave markers, and their faces are concealed because they're embedded in these stones, and so you have to kind of look at them from the side in order to see their, their likeness, and it sort of creates these like miniature monuments to people who had to you know, hide in the shadows in previous generations, um, but that should have some recognition. Uh, so these smaller sculptures led to a larger uh, memorial sculpture that I did in the Hudson River Park in New York. Uh, these are a series of nine large bronze stones. Um, they're cast stones and then patinaed to look as if they're granite and several of them are bisected and then fitted back together with prismatic glass. And so when the light or the sun hits them at certain angles, that prismatic effect uh, creates a full color spectrum rainbow in different spots. Um, and then the largest stone in the center is bisected and there's no glass. There's this inward facing quote from Audre Lorde. Um, so, it kind of creates this circular formation where this is the largest stone and it's almost the apex of that structure. And that circular formation alludes to um, other burial markers like Native American uh, burial grounds, um, African monoliths, Stonehenge. It's a sort of innate human structure that's been found throughout time and I wanted to, to mimic that. Uh, this is an image of it at night the glass actually lights up as well um, to kind of create this illuminated uh, fissure. And the idea that these stones have been split apart and then mended back together with a material that's seemingly fragile uh, alludes to a pottery, a Japanese pottery technique of kintsugi, I think is how you say it, um, or kintsugi. I always get it wrong, but uh, it's when you mend pottery with gold leaf and those uh, minded joints are actually stronger than the original pottery and it also is really beautiful and records the scar and the rupture of the, the vessel. And so uh, I utilized that sort of reference here with the, with the glass. Um, these are a series of works also on Mylar um, investigating the idea of portraiture but once again sort of circumventing the likeness of the, center, the sitter. So these are um, all titled Anonymous Self-Portrait. They have um, certain recollections of earlier self-portraits that I had done. Uh, these are not actual self-portraits, but I liked playing with the idea of that 
you know, the name is almost an oxymoron in that it's an anonymous self-portrait. Like they can't really go together um, that well. And the figures are caught in these architecturally blocked out shapes that loosely correspond to clothing. And it's not clear if they are revealing themselves or concealing themselves. And there's this kind of awkward gesture within them. Um, and so I was interested in exploring that idea of portraiture through almost like motion and, and dance and movement. Um, similarly, I was taking elements uh, from different images of people that you know are traditionally thought of as, as beautiful and combining them in multiples to create almost like a Frankensteinian uh, portrait of someone. So it's almost the idea of like so much beauty being compacted into one person that they become grotesque. Um, and so these are, are quite large, like this is about five feet by seven and a half feet. Um, and again, it's on mylar and I'm using like a spray gun to kind of create these almost graffiti marks. And those are created on the front and the back. So when you see the image uh, in person, it has a very three-dimensional sense of, of depth to it that unfortunately kind of gets flattened out when you try to photograph it and document it. Um, but I kind of felt like, you know, I, I again had another one of those moments where I was looking at my work and had a almost reaction against it. I had gone through this period where I felt like I stripped out all the color from my work and wanted to really focus on uh, form and just this level of drawing and be reductive in a way. And um, I was realizing that the mylar, because it's so smooth, it was allowing me to record almost every detail. And it was the type of thing where I was getting sucked into that level of detail. And even as I was making something, I was like, you know, this doesn't matter. No one's going to notice this, but I still would get caught up in it. And I'm one of those people that I have a bunch of different ideas and I want to be able to get through them. And so I decided to kind of switch gears and work in a way that would help loosen me up. Um, and so I began working on canvas on like a really rough linen texture canvas in the hopes that that intense texture would make it so that I couldn't be that detailed. Um, I also used it as an opportunity to inject color back into my work. Um, and I think, you know, even when I was working with color previously, there were certain kind of color combinations or specific colors that I had steered away from just because I felt like they were garish or something. I don't know. I just had a strange innate aversion to them. And so I kind of felt like, OK, well, if I don't like it, I should investigate why and force myself to use it. And I often, if I feel myself being hesitant to do something, I'll force myself to do it uh, to make sure that I really don't want to do it. And, um, it turns out I was wrong and I actually do like it. So um, this is an image called Inflatable Pieta. Um, it's an earlier work on canvas. And you know I hadn't worked on canvas in almost like 28 years. So I felt like I was uh, sort of learning how to do it again as I approached it. But I feel like this is also a good example of what I had mentioned earlier, this level of ambiguity uh, in the sense that you know, you could look at this image and it can be somebody that's stargazing at night or it can be uh, like a, a drowning victim or a refugee who's been uh, salvaged by this flotation device. So the, the idea that a single image could be two diametrically opposed narratives is really interesting to me and it's something that I strive for in my work. Um, there's also, you may have noticed, a lot of references to art historical figures like the Flemish uh, landscapes, um, Duchamp, uh, here uh, references to like uh, Van Gogh's potato eaters. Um, I studied art history as an undergrad, and so there are certain images that have always stayed with me, and you know they kind of just come out uh, when I'm working. And sometimes I realize it and push it. Sometimes it's a nice surprise afterwards. But I'm always kind of thinking about all these different uh, artists and uh, film directors. Um, 
This is called Perched for Success, a uh, portrait with bird shit. Um, this is multitasker. And I mean, I feel like a lot of them, a lot of these were done during pandemic lockdown, um, but they sort of have these tongue-in-cheek humorous titles and uh, humorous moments within them, like this is waiting room haze and you know, the fact that this smoke which is normally light and ethereal, is just kind of like weighting him down. Um, this is uh, a longer title that I'm not sure if I remember. It's a portrait of an only child as the Sistine Chapel or something like that. But uh, they, you know, they kind of evoke the, the level of like ennui or um, boredom um, that I, for one, was feeling during lockdown. Um, so uh, this one is Fountain, Golden Boy. Uh, this image is called The Crossing. Again, some have more obvious you know, references to a, a narrative interaction. And um, again, you can see that idea of like immigration, climate change, transition, um, and also this idea or notion of like a futility of um, the devices that are supposed to help us. Um, this is Vigil. Um, this is portrait with tortoise, milk, and pipe, or no, tobacco. This is portrait with poppies and port. Um, I think this is really like deep into the pandemic. You can sense the boredom. <laughs> so, um, and then again here, you know, the reference um, that I was thinking of while working was uh, this painting by Goya of one of the court uh, members' children. Uh, he has like a bird kind of tied to a string at the bottom of his feet, and so here the the guy in the front has a falcon. Um, it's almost the reverse, where the bird has now become like the predator. Um, this is Death, the Barber, and the Plague. Um, I gave a lot of haircuts during the pandemic because uh, all my friends called me up and was like, do you still cut hair? <laughs> so, um, this is a little bit of an ode to Peter Hujar. Um, and uh, I also... I guess in my mind in painting this was kind of thinking more of like a sort of Cortan steel sculptural form. Um, this is Odalisque with kickstand. And for this final image, uh, this is wounded. Um, and so yeah, I'm still working in this vein, um, exploring the idea of like, painting on canvas and this kind of rougher texture and how to incorporate the elements that I've learned in working in photography and drawing and, and expand it into this realm. So thank you.